All right, so I'm gonna do a lecture here over um, 7.6. I think it's uh, specifically uh, constraints due to pulleys is, um, let's see if I can get this out here. Yeah, constraints due to ropes and pulleys. So this is a continuation of 7.6. And, and really, what, what the, the point of it is, is it's saying that if you have a, say, a, some kind of pulley here, could be a, a cylinder, it could just be a, um, yeah, just a s small cylinder uh, disc. If you have a pulley here, and um, let's say you attach a crate on the end, that the velocity of this crate or this object, we'll just call it the object. I apologize for the shadows. Um, yeah, I'll try and do my best here. Um, the velocity of the object, right, that this is moving, let's say it's moving um, downwards, that the velocity of that object has to be equal to the velocity of the, the rim of the uh, wheel and and because this is true and we know the velocity of the rim of the wheel is equal to the uh, wheels rotational velocity times the radius then we can say that the velocity of the object is equal to omega r as well so we can make this connection here that the velocity of the object is equal sorry is equal to omega r. And the same thing if, um, say, the object is accelerating. Um, maybe it's also got an acceleration directed downwards equal to a, and I'll call it a object. Then the acceleration of the object is equal to the acceleration of the rim which is also equal to the angular velocity or angular acceleration of the, the rim times r. And so we can say that the acceleration of the object is equal to alpha r. So making this connection here, um, due to an object and a pulley, because it's connected by a rope, um, this object being a crate, and this pulley, um, right here and, uh, and and that's the idea so in this next problem we'll, we'll do we'll look at this and um, notice one thing we, we didn't really worry about we just assumed that the velocity was in the same direction here as here um, and I guess it kind of is right if this was rotating say this way um, <clears throat> that uh, that would be a um, negative angular velocity, but we're really not going to worry about it too much, just as long as it matches up. So meaning that this, um, this velocity is going to be in the same direction as this velocity, uh, according to its sign. Um, it's, the magnitudes are going to be the same. So uh, we'll try not to be tripped up too much by the signs. And um, I'm actually going to do this example problem slightly different than the textbook because of that. And uh, we're looking at example number um, 7.19 here, uh, time for a bucket to fall. So let's go ahead and write that down. And uh, in this problem, it says that Josh has raised a bucket up with a, uh, uh, it says a, a 2.5 kilogram bucket of water using a Wells winch when he uh, accidentally let go of the handle. Um, so what we have here is something like this. I'm just gonna go ahead and make the sketch. Uh, we have a cylinder. 
and we have the rope that's going around the cylinder and I think over on this side we have the bucket that is hanging down and what ha what's happening happening here is this bucket is being brought up and then all of a sudden the uh, it says the the winch consists of a rope wrapped around a three kilogram uh, diameter four centimeter diameter cylinder which rotates on the axle through the center the bucket is released so so what's going to happen is he's bringing this bucket up and then um, all of a sudden he's going to let go and the bucket's gonna, then going to start to fall right so it's going to be starting at a velocity of zero here um, but there's a couple things we can note here one is that the the mass of the bucket we're going to use lowercase m is equal to um, 2.5 kilograms whereas the mass of the cylinder up here we're going to use capital M is equal to 3 kilograms the diameter of the cylinder um, is going to be 4 centimeters so the radius of the cylinder is going to be um, 2 centimeters uh, also known as uh, 0.02 meters all right, um, what else do they tell us here? They say the bucket is released four meters above the water. So it looks like this bucket was being brought up uh, four meters above the water, and then it stops, and then it's going to be let go, and the bucket's going to fall, right? So we have the water down here, and this distance right here being four meters away. We'll go ahead and call that uh, delta y. All right, um, good. I think that's all we know. Um, we know that when the bucket is being brought up and then um, uh, he accidentally lets go of the handle that um, the bucket's gonna start moving downwards from a velocity of zero. So uh, the bucket's gonna start from rest and then start falling. So we can call uh, the velocity initial here is equal to zero. Mm, I think that that's about it. Okay, so what's the question here? It says, how long does it take the bucket to reach the water? All right, so coming back down here and looking at this, we know that the time it's gonna take to reach the water is T, and we wanna know what that is. So, um, you know, really simply, this, this looks like a kinematics problem. Um, we might say the bucket is just in uh, free fall, but it's not, right? Because um, it's actually going to fall a little slower than 9.81 because there's this tension here um, from the, the cylinder that when the bucket falls, the cylinder still has to turn. So it's going to slow down the bucket and it's not going to accelerate at 9.81. So what's it going to accelerate at? Well, we're probably going to have to find that. Um, so uh, to find T down here, we know delta Y, we know VI. I um, think it may be uh, something without VF in it. So get rid of K1 and K3. So maybe just K2, right? So if we look at K2 here, uh, I think I got space right here. Uh, K2, we can go ahead and write delta Y equals VI times T plus one half AT squared. All right, um, let's go ahead and sub in uh, four meters. VI is zero, so we have zero times T, which we don't know. We wanna know how long it's gonna take for the, the bucket to fall and hit the water. Uh, plus one half the acceleration, which um, we'll just call it A. You notice I call this positive four meters, so I'm gonna go ahead and assume that, um, I could probably write this right here. I'm gonna assume down is positive and up is negative. All right, so uh, coming back over here, uh, we have one half AT squared. Simplify this, four meters is equal to one half AT squared. T then, uh, kick the times both sides by two, divide by A. So I'm gonna get eight meters divided by acceleration is equal to T squared. Uh, square root of both sides, t then is equal to the square root of 
8 meters uh, over A. Or root 8 meters over A, or radical 8 meters over A. All right. Um, good. Okay, so that, that really doesn't isn't going to help us solve it, right? Because we don't know the acceleration of the bucket. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that right there. Hopefully come back to that. Um, let's go up to the bucket now. I'm kind of, kind of working our way up, right? And say, well, what's going on with the bucket's acceleration? So I'm thinking forces, free body diagram. Um, let's go ahead and draw that. Uh, I don't know. Um, let's draw it. Let's draw it, it's kind of a mess right there, so let's draw it right here. Okay, so we got the sketch of the bucket, draw a dot in the center, two forces here, right? Force gravity, which is gonna be larger than the force that's pulling up on it, slowing it down, which is tension. All right, um, pretty good. Uh, we want to know the net acceleration of the bucket, so we're thinking Newton's second law. Um, let's go ahead and write that. So Newton's second law in the y direction. So some of the forces in the y direction is equal to ma y. All right, we got uh, forces in the y direction. T is pointed up. Fg is pointed down. But we're going to call, yeah, we're going to call Fg positive, right? Because down is positive y. So I probably should have wrote that as uh, Fg minus T, right? Ooh, this is just turning into a mess. Let me write that over. All right, so Fg is positive minus T is equal to M, which is going to be lowercase m, right, for the bucket. Um, and uh, acceleration is just going to equal A. Okay, so then we have uh, Fg is Mg um, minus T, which we don't know what that is, uh, equals M times A. Divide both sides by M. Okay. Just looking at that. All right, so we're going to end up getting uh, mg, mg divided by m, which is just going to be g, right, minus t divided by m. Remember, both the g, mg has to be divided by m and the t has to be divided by m is equal to the acceleration. Okay. So we want time, we need acceleration, we want acceleration, now we need tension. We do know what M is and we do know what G is. Uh, M is um, the mass of the bucket, which is 2.5 kg, so I could have subbed that in. And baby G is obviously 9.81. Just the magnitude there, because uh, we already accounted for sine by making this positive. All right, um, pretty good. Um, so we gotta keep moving up, right? We need, we need to know what this tension is. So what we can think here is that the tension pulling up on the bucket is this, this tension is the same as the tension pulling down on the cylinder. All right, and so, and why is that important? Because this, this tension right here is a value T at a distance R away and it's at 90 degrees, so we know forces a distance from the pivot at 90 degrees are going to do torque, right? So we know that the torque from tension, oops, uh, I was going to write, I'll just write it this way, that the torque of tension is equal to um, the force tension, right, is equal to um, R cross F, well, well, how should I write this? I'll, I'll write it this way. I'll write it as um, R cross T, right? Um, 
R cross T, which is really uh, the torque due to tension is equal to R T sine 90. Sine 90 is just one, and so we can say that the torque due to tension is equal to RT. Okay, so I had to pause it for a second because I wanted another shot at explaining um, this a little differently. So, um, so once again, we, we want to know tension, but to get tension we need torque. Um, so if we think back to um, uh, a couple lessons ago, right, we learned that uh, torque uh, just like force is equal to MA, torque is equal to I alpha, right? So we can um, solve for this torque uh, if we know um, I and alpha, right? Because ultimately we want to know what T is. So I'm going to use this relationship right here. So we can say that torque due to tension is equal to I alpha. Well, what the heck is I alpha? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and write RT here, right? Because we know that torque is really uh, R times tension, and tension is what we want. Uh, I is the moment of inertia of a cylinder, right? Uh, for a cylinder, we can say that uh, I is equal to, um, and this we'll just have to get from uh, the textbook, is equal to 1 half MR squared. So let's go ahead and write that in right here. And we're using capital M because it's the mass of the cylinder. And then finally, we need, we need alpha here. Now, we just learned that alpha is equal to, um, is, is uh, well, we learned a while ago, right, that um, alpha times R is equal to A. And then, therefore, sorry, I got, got it written multiple places, then, therefore, uh, alpha is equal to A over R. And the reason this is important is because the acceleration at the rim is the same acceleration as, as the bucket, right? So this acceleration of the bucket down here, this A is this exact same A of <clears throat> the, the rim of the cylinder. So long story short, we can keep this as the same A variable and plug it in right there. Right, so I just took A over R and plugged it in right here for alpha. So this is gonna allow me to get torque because torque allows me to get tension. All right, and once I have tension, then I can get acceleration, and acceleration will give me time. All right, so this is quite a long way we're looking back. So, so what we have here then is Newton's second law for the cylinder, right? For this cylinder, which is going to give us tension for the rope, because the rope is pulling down and on the cylinder and pulling up on the bucket. They're Newton's third law pairs. And once we have tension, we can get acceleration of the, well, it's actually acceleration of both, right? The rim and the object, which is the bucket. And once we have that, then we know the time the bucket takes to get to the ground because it's accelerating down after it was let go. All right, so anyhow, coming back to this now. So we have this mess here, we want tension. Okay. So um, so what am I going to do here? Well, I think we can simplify. Okay, so we have R times tension is equal to um, 1 half times MR squared times A over R. Well, there's an R on bottom and an R squared on top, right? Because this is really, if I rewrite this, this is really 1 half M R squared A, and this R is really on bottom, right? So I'm saying we should be able to cancel off. Let me get my pen. Lost my red pen somehow. Uh, let me grab another one. No, it's in my. It's in, no. All right. Um, so I'm gonna cancel off one of these R's. Just like that. And and then I can rewrite this. 
So once I do that, I get RT equals uh, one half um, MR, right? So this is really, um, I guess I could just write it as M R A over two, right? I don't need, really need to write that one on top. Now I'll look at both sides. Both sides have an R, we can get rid of an R. Divide both sides by R, right? So now I'm left with T equals MA over two. And we ensure this is capital M for the mass of uh, the, the um, cylinder or the pulley or whatever you wanna call it. All right, so um, that's pretty good. And we got our expression for T, which is what we wanted. This is what we, we came for, right? So now we're gonna take that and plug it back in right here into this. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this expression right here. G minus T over little m, the mass of the bucket, is equal to A. So by plugging this in for T, I should be able to solve for A. That's the idea. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. So we're gonna end up with G minus M, big M times A. Um, the two is gonna go to the bottom with the M because that's how algebra works. And we have the A right there. So you can kind of see where this is going, right? Okay, so let's rewrite it with some numbers in here. We have 9.81 meters per second squared minus uh, big M, which I think the mass of the cylinder is three kilograms. A we don't know. The, uh, the mass of the bucket is 2.5. So on the bottom I have two times 2.5 kilograms, which is gonna be five kilograms. So we're saying that, so we have three kilograms over five kilograms times A, or we can just put this on top, right, is equal to A, uh, 9.81 minus that. All right, so we're left with this. Okay, so looking at this, kilograms go away. Three over five, what is that in a decimal? Uh, 0 0.6? Sure. Add this to both sides, we're gonna get um, 9.81 meters per second squared equal to 1.6 times the acceleration. Divide both sides by 1.6. So we're gonna get A is equal to um, uh, 9.81 divided by 1.6. What is that equal to? Uh, let's get the calculator out. I think I should already have it. Six point one three, uh, yeah. So we're gonna go ahead. Whoops. Six point one three meters per second squared. So the bucket is accelerating downwards slower than nine point eight one, like we predicted, right? And uh, because it's being pulled up at the same time by the tension in the rope. Okay. So now, finally we can get the time. <laughs> so we have this acceleration, we'll just plug it in here for A, and we'll get T. So if we do that, let me go ahead and grab a new sheet of paper, because I like writing large. Um, we can go ahead and write that T is equal to the square root of eight M. That's little m, so that's the mass of the bucket divided by A, we're gonna sub in um, that 6.13, right? Okay, we're gonna sub that in right there. So we're saying T is equal to the square root of 8M 
I guess I could have wrote um, 2.5 there. All right, anyways. Might as well do it, right? Let's get rid of that. Okay. Not super happy with those units. Why don't I like that? Let me think about that. Um, oh, that's not 8M. That's 8 meters. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. All right. <laughs> So, this is such a long problem. This is eight meters, four meters, eight meters. I gotta be really careful there. Um, that's, that's dangerous. That looked like the mass of the bucket. All right, so coming back to this, let's correct it. <clears throat> we can then say that this is just eight meters on top. We don't need any of this, right? And so why is that important? Because meters cancel meters. Second squared is a fraction on the bottom of the fraction, it floats to the top. So we can say then t is equal to the square root of eight second squared over 6.13. And so we're gonna square root eight over 6.13, we're gonna square root the second squared. So if we do that, we get uh, eight divided by 6.13 is equal to 1.305. We're then gonna take the square root of that, square root, second answer, and we get 1.14, or as the book has it, 1.1 seconds. So go ahead and write that down. All right, and that is how it's done. All right, so once again, we had a, a bucket attached to a pulley. We wanted to know how long it took to hit the ground. We came up with this expression, t equals square root of eight meters over the acceleration. We needed the acceleration, so we looked at the bucket, drew a free body diagram, wrote Newton's second law for the, um, in the y direction to find acceleration. We got this expression right here, and, uh, and that was good um, because uh, <clears throat> that told us um, that we needed tension. So then we looked up here at the cylinder. We, we knew that the tension was equal to uh, the, the radius times, or the, the torque due to tension is, is equal. Torque is equal to the radius times the tension. We want tension. So if we can get torque, we can get tension. So we know that torque is I alpha. Uh, torque is equal to RT. I just plugged it in right there because I really want T. I is one half MR squared for a cylinder. Alpha, alpha is equal to rearranging A equals alpha R. Alpha is equal to A over R. Um, solved it for T, got an expression for T. Plug the expression for T back in here. Found A is 6.13 or so. I can't remember off the top of my head. 6.13, yeah. And, and then plug that in here for time. Square root eight meters, not mass. <laughs> Be careful, divided by 6.13 meters per second squared and solve for the T of 1.14 seconds or 1.1 seconds to hit the water. All right, that's how it's done. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about rolling and then we'll call it quits. All right, so the idea with rolling motion is that, um, and this is probably better drawn in the book than I'm gonna draw it here but uh, doesn't mean we can't talk about it. Okay, the idea with rolling motion is that when um, an object, I think in the book they just call it rolling motion, so I'm gonna go ahead and write that at the top. Mm -hmm. 
when an object rolls without slipping is what we like to say. Um, as this goes through one revolution, one complete roll from here to say here, this distance that it travels is uh, in, in one revolution. So I'm going to write uh, maybe the wheels rolling this direction. Um, I'll just write this is one revolution. All right, so in one revolution, the center of this wheel, not the outside, the outside does some kind of weird uh, arc. Um, the center, the distance the center travels is equal to the circumference. So this distance is the circumference. Um, And so this distance is delta x, which is equal to circumference of a circle, which is 2 pi, I'm going to use capital R, because I can. All right, is equal to 2 pi r. Now, it achieves this distance, delta x, in one revolution. Well, what's the time to go one revolution? Well, that would be the period, or capital T. Right? Okay. So if we want to know the velocity of the center of the wheel, it's equal to delta x then divided by the time, right? Well, delta x is going to be 2 pi r, right? Because we said that that's the distance it's going to travel in one revolution for the center. And the time is going to be the period or t. Now, if the units are, um, say, um, mm, say radians, right, uh, then we have radians, 2 pi radians right here, if this is in units of 2 pi radians, right, times the radius, divided by the period, this is equal to omega. So we can say that this is the same as omega um, times r. So what we're seeing then is that the velocity of the center is equal to 2 pi r over the period, which is the same as omega r, which is the same as the velocity of the rim, right? Which is also equal to omega r. So the center and the rim are moving the same velocities, right? Okay, so what does that mean? Why is that important? And this is assuming it's rolling without slipping. Well, let's, let's, let's look at it a little further and see what that exactly means. Well, all right, so if you have um, a, a rolling object, you have two types of motion. And rolling object, a rolling object is equal to the combination of two types of motion. One is translational, and one is rotational. Rotational. Spelling not great right now. All right, so what we have here then is translational. So assuming this object's moving that way, right, rolling that way, um, we know that if it wasn't rolling and it was merely just moving this direction, then this point, this point, and this point would all have a velocity like so, right? they would all have a velocity v. Now, we also know that if it wasn't moving, if it wasn't sliding, right, this way, and it was just spinning, right, and not moving, that it would have this velocity right here, 
um, would be, uh, well, it would be, um, it would be equal to, um, it would be equal to omega times r, right? Because this is spinning this way, right? Right here. So we know that um, rotationally, this would be, uh, we'll call it positive omega r because it's going forward. And down here, we would have this rotation, which would be negative omega r. Now I realize that's counterclockwise, or no, uh, this is both clockwise, and, and I'm making it, uh, I'm making one positive and one negative, but, but you get the idea because this rotational velocity here is equal to V and this rotational velocity here is equal to negative V, right? Because it's moving backwards. This is if it was, if it was just spinning, right? We would have this velocity right here from it spinning at omega, a distance away, we'd have a positive velocity. And if it was just spinning, it would have uh, this distance away. We would have omega times r. But since this right here, this is pointing this direction, we're calling it a positive velocity. And since this is pointing this direction, this is equal to uh, a negative velocity. All right, because of the vectors. Um, I realize that both of these are... Um, are, are clockwise, all right? It, the top of the wheel is spinning in the same direction as the bottom of the wheel, but uh, this has a velocity of right, uh, so it's positive, and this has a velocity of left, so it's negative. Okay, um, so the combination of these two, what about the middle? The middle's not spinning. So the combination of these two then is gonna be V plus V, or two V, so this means the top of the wheel is spinning twice as fast because not only is it translating or sliding, or, or I shouldn't even say sliding, right? I should just say moving. It's moving forward. Um, and it's at the same time it's moving forward, it's spinning forward. So we have even a greater velocity when it rolls. And here for the middle, well, we have the velocity plus nothing. So here at the middle, we just have Put all these points in, keep it, it looks a little bit better. At the middle we have just V, right? Because V plus zero is V. All right, but what about the bottom? Check that out, right? Positive V plus negative V. What's the velocity here? Well, this is saying that um, at the bottom, uh, V equals omega R equals zero. So the very bottom is stopped. So we're saying that if an object is rolling without sliding, its velocity, instantaneous velocity at any point is equal to zero. That's what we're saying. Because what's happening there, if I grab this like roll of tape, right, is that if you look at the bottom, if this is the bottom, let me see if I can draw, this is the bottom, that as it's moving this way, right, the wheel is moving this way, right? So we're saying that if it's not sliding, if there's no velocity, when we say it's rolling without sliding, what we mean is there's no velocity at the bottom. It's not sliding forward, right? It's rolling without sliding, and therefore its velocity at the very bottom is equal to zero, while its velocity at the top instantaneously is 2v, and its velocity in the center is just v. That's what we're saying here, and that's why that's important. If it was sliding, um, say, forward, then this would no longer be zero. It would be greater than zero um, and because it's sliding forward. Uh, so that's the idea, and that's why you always see that on physics problems. That means you can, uh, you can assume that the, the bottom of the wheel isn't moving instantaneously. Um, you can assume that... Uh, that the velocity of the center is equal to omega r and that the velocity of the rim is equal to omega r. And um, if the object is 
um, rolling without um, slipping or rolling without sliding. So um, that that's why um, we need to set this up. All right, hopefully that's a little clearer. If not, obviously read the book and hopefully uh, both explanations together help and, uh, and we'll call it there. So um, that's it.